the church when all I see When all I see is the battle You see my victory When all I see is a mountain You see a mountain moved And as I walk through the shadow Your love surrounds me Sing in faith There's nothing to fear For I am saved Every voice. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you.
is where I lay it down. You are all I'm chasing now. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. June 5th, 1944, Nazi Germany has overtaken Europe, Poland has fallen, France followed suit, Britain's freedom hangs by a thread and the next 24 hours will determine the fate, not just of Europe and Britain, but most likely of the entire Western world. At 9.30 p.m., the 101st Airborne of the United States, known as the tip of the spear, takes off from Britain to be part of the largest invasion in history, we know it as D-Day. Among the 101st Airborne are two medics, Robert Wright and Kenneth Moore. Like most of the 101st Airborne, they are misdropped. Like most medics, they lose the bulk of their medic supplies in the drop, landing only with what is carried on their belts with them. They end up in this small, out of the way, non-strategic town known as Angoville, France. Very quickly, Robert Moore stumbles onto this 900 year old church building, which he immediately thinks this will serve as a great aid station. He goes inside, it's a very small room and it has pews just lining the building. So he says, this will work for us to lay soldiers on. He takes out his Red Cross flag. He affixes it to the door to, as a sign to both armies, hey, this is a medic's aid station. This is not a place of war. Uh, more quickly finds a wheelbarrow and he begins going out to the fields nearby, finding soldiers who have been shot or otherwise injured, putting them in the wheelbarrow, taking them back to this 900 year old church building where they would lay them on a pew and work on them. They rotated doing this over about a 36 hour period. The church quickly fills up with the wounded. The town of Angoville trades hands between German and American forces several times over that time period. There's fierce fighting breaking out. The night is anything but uneventful as well. At one point, they're working on the wounded. They hear a crash because a bomb crashed through the roof. Everybody in the tiny church freezes, but it's a dud. They pick it up and throw it out just to be safe. The stained glass gets completely shot out. At one point, a German officer bursts through the doors with his machine gun, but when he sees what they're doing, he crosses himself and he leaves. At one point, when the church, when the area is under German control, a German officer walks in, but when he sees that they are treating soldiers, both German and American, without regards to uniform, he promises through broken English to send a doctor as soon as he's able. Well, eventually the fighting moves on to more strategic footholds like you've seen on Band of Brothers and that type of thing. And eventually, of course, the war is won by the Allies and the Nazis, the Germans are defeated. Moore and Wright both receive silver stars uh, for their work in that church on D-Day. But as amazing as that story is, what strikes me is not what happened on D-Day, but what the townspeople did afterwards. Because when the people of Angoville after the war needed to rebuild literally their lives. They obviously worked on their houses, but then their attention turned to the church and they fixed the hole in the roof. They replaced the stained glass that had all been shot out. There's actually some stained glass of paratroopers in that church building today. But then they came to the pews. And when they came to the pews, it was a unique situation because they were these old, beautiful pews. But as you can imagine from soldiers who'd been shot and injured in war, there was blood on them. And so in my thinking, they had to do something. I mean, if you come to church and sit down and there's blood on your seat, that's kind of disgusting. <laughs> so if it was me, I would have said, well, just replace the pews. Just, just get those few ones with blood on them, chuck them, let's get some new pews. Or at minimum, if you wanna keep the old ones, that's fine. Let's maybe sand them down, restain them so they look fresh and clean and new as people come to worship. But the people of Angoville did something different. They said this church was built 900 years ago to be a place of hope and healing for those who are injured and hopeless and hurting. And on D-Day, they said, that's what it was. So they said, we will preserve the bloodstained pews. 
We will preserve the bloodstained pews both as a memory to what happened on D-Day, but also to signify what this church was built to be and what it was on that day. That no matter your uniform, no matter your ethnicity, no matter if you had done something wrong yourself or somebody else did it to you, you could come here and this was a place for you to be healed and made whole. And I gotta tell you, when I first heard that story, it gave me chills because I thought that's the best picture of church I've ever seen. Because this church, any church, every church, the capital C worldwide church should be a church, metaphorically of bloodstained pews, where the broken, where the hurting, the wounded, the bleeding can come to get help. I wanna be a part of a church of bloodstained pews. I wanna be a part of a church that is known for being a place where the broken and hurting and lost can come and find grace and truth to set them free. And then they can go join the mission of fighting for the kingdom of God against evil in this world. And listen, that's not Carl's idea of church. That's Jesus' idea of church. Because here are some things that Jesus said. Jesus said, if you're tired and weary, come here. Jesus said, if you're a bruised reed, I won't break you. If, if the light in you is just a smoldering wick, Jesus says, I won't put it out. Jesus says, if you're like a little child, I'm yours, come on. He's saying, if you're bruised, if your faith is weak, if you are bleeding, if you're broken, he's saying, I gotcha, come on in. And then when you pair those kind of statements with this statement that says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it, you understand what the church is. Because think about this, I used to misunderstand what Jesus said when he said that. I used to think it meant that hell was attacking church and that the church would squeak out the victory. But when you remember high school history class, that's not what Jesus is saying. Remember that ancient cities were walled cities. And to get in and out of the city, they had gates. And if you were going to attack an ancient city, you didn't attack the thick stone wall. That wasn't going to get you anywhere. You attacked at the weakest position. What'd you attack? You attacked the gates. So when Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell won't overcome it, what he is casting for us is a vision of the church attacking hell, snatching people from the flames, bringing them to a place of bloodstained pews where they can be healed and put back together by the great physician and then join his mission of bringing hope to this world. The problem, a lot of you know this already, the problem is that's not most people's experience with church. I mean, we've seen the data, we've seen the surveys, you talk to people you know. Some of us, when we share our own experiences, the words most associated with church that we hear are often judgmental or hypocritical. And I think maybe the most hurtful one is simply this, irrelevant. Like church, it, it just is irrelevant, it doesn't even matter. And even those of us who love the church, we know some of those bad experiences. We know people who've been through that. So what can we expect from the church? And most important, what does Jesus say the church should be? What does Jesus say the church should be? Well, I guess I should say, if we haven't met, my name is Carl. <laughs> it is nice to meet you. And I am one of three executive pastors who serve Kyle and our staff here. We have Tim Hester, we have Steve Carter, and we have myself as our three executive pastors here. And a little while ago, I was really excited when Kyle asked me if I would be willing to teach a three-week series of my own. And I knew immediately what I wanted to teach on because God has changed my life in many ways through the church, but arguably the way he's impacted me the most in the church is he's given me community. I have experienced the community of the capital C church. In fact, the word church means community. It means coming together. But in this generation where we have filtered community and fake community, where we are more isolated than ever, I wanna speak for these three weeks on the longing in your soul to be known. Of the longing in your soul to be connected because it is not good for man to be alone. 
I want you in community. More important, God wants you in community. And so this series, we are gonna take steps to get there. There's a barrier though. And we're gonna show you what it is tonight. I want you to reach into the seat pocket in front of you, every location right now. And there is a sheet of paper there. Every single person needs to do this. And there will be pens or pencils along with that. Before you fill that out, let me give you some instructions. On that paper is a survey with some personal questions that are yes, no questions. I'm gonna ask you to fill that out in just a moment, but before we do, please listen. Don't put your name on it. <laughs> this, is, this is anonymous paper time. If you need to cover it up, I'd encourage you to do that. If you need to scoot a seat away from the person sitting next to you so they don't see what you write, you feel free to do that. Be honest. If you are honest, you're gonna help somebody in this service. And please, every single person participate. There will be a moment in this service where you will wish you had filled this out. This will feel risky, but I promise you it is worth it. Once you've filled that out, fold it in half, and when you're done, our ushers are gonna pass something down your row for you to stick that in. Just take about 30 seconds and fill that out right now. Usher's going to keep passing those until we've collected all of those, and we'll come back to that in a few moments. But even answering those questions makes us feel alone, doesn't it? <laughs> right? And what that points to is our desire that we have to connect at a deep level and be truly known. I don't know if you saw this ad that circulated online several years ago out of the city of Atlanta. Uh, it read like this, single black female seeks male companionship, ethnicity not important. I'm a very good looking girl who loves to play. I love long walks in the woods, long car rides, camping, cozy winter nights lying by the fire. Candlelight dinners will have me eating out of your hand. Rub me the right way and watch me respond. I'll be at the front door when you get home wearing only what nature gave me. Kiss me and I'm yours. Call this number and ask for Daisy. 15,000 men called the number of this ad only to reach the Atlanta Humane Society where a nine-week-old black lab named Daisy lived. Some of y'all are getting a little nervous. Like, I thought sexual generosity was a couple weeks ago. <laughs> so let's jump in to scripture. Our scripture today is going to be the calling of Matthew. I want you to look at Mark chapter two, verse 13. Then Jesus went out to the lake shore again and taught the crowds that were coming to him. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up and followed him. Let me show you a couple things here. I've highlighted a few different words. It, it, he's called Levi here. Levi is his name in Hebrew. In Greek, his name is Matthew. So when you read about either of those in the New Testament, it's the same person. And it says he was a tax collector. And if you've been in church, we know that tax collectors were looked down on, but let me make sure we know why. Tax collectors,
collecting in the Roman Empire went to the highest bidder. So essentially, anybody who wanted to could say, I'll be the tax collector, and here's how much Roman government I'll get you. And whoever said the highest amount got the job. The catch was anything on top of that, the tax collector got to keep as his own. So Jewish people despise tax collectors for two different reasons. One reason was because the better you were at ripping people off, the better tax collector you were, and they were getting ripped off. The other is they worked for the Roman government who they viewed as the occupiers and oppressors of the land that was rightfully theirs. So tax collectors were despised. In fact, uh, the day that someone accepted a job of being a tax collector, they were expelled, they were excommunicated from the Jewish place of worship, the synagogue. That's how uh, despised they were. Verse 15, later, Levi invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. There were many people of this kind among Jesus' followers. But when the teachers of religious law, who are Pharisees, saw him eating with tax collectors and other sinners, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with such scum? Now, the New Living Translation is actually helping us understand this here because the Greek translation of this word for word would say, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? But because of what we just explained about tax collecting, the NLT is trying to explain it so we understand the meaning of what Jesus is saying, not just the actual words. In fact, the word Pharisee means separate. So what the Pharisees are asking is, how come Jesus doesn't separate himself from people like that like we do? When Jesus heard this, meaning when Jesus overheard this, he told him, hey, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. Now, Jesus is Captain Obvious here, right? You do not have to have, to have a medical degree to know if you work in an emergency room, you're not there to help the person who came in for a checkup. You are there to help the person with a broken femur, right? In fact, um, I've read a scientific article recently that there is a category of people who are known in the United States as the worst sick people in the entire world. The scientific name of them is husbands. And the data says when a wife has the flu, she goes to work, she makes dinner, she takes care of the kids, she runs errands, she pretty much does everything she normally does, she's just suffering while she does it. Meanwhile, when a husband has the flu, he moans and groans and can't work and can't parent and can't reach his water on the bedside table and resorts to moaning. So his wife runs up the stairs thinking if she needs to call 911, knowing she just has to pick up his water and give him a sip out of a straw. <laughs> Jesus came for the husbands. No, I'm kidding. Jesus came for the sick people. And he goes on, I've come to call not those who think they're righteous, but those who know they're sinners. He's saying to the Pharisees, you think you're righteous. These people know they're not. So first lesson today, Jesus came for the broken. Look back at verse 15. Who did Levi invite? Tax collectors, disreputable sinners, and many people of this kind. Jesus came for the broken. Whenever I hear that word broken or broke, I think of this old viral clip. Jaden has one dollar bill, one quarter, and two pennies. How, how, much, money, how much money does he have? Jaden broke. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they should be teaching in school, right? <laughs> Jesus came, Jesus came for Jaden, and Jesus came for the broken. I read an article once that was titled The Atrocious Mathematics of the Gospel. And the author talked about how grace, how Jesus does not make mathematical sense. Jesus describes God one time like a shepherd. And he says, this shepherd leaves 99 sheep in the open country where they could be kidnapped, where they could run away, where they could be injured, all for one who's gone. 
In the Gospel of John, a woman pours a year's salary worth of perfume. Think of that. A year's salary just pours it out on Jesus. And he says, she did a good thing. Jesus tells another story to explain grace. And he says, you know what grace is like? Grace, when God gives it, is kind of like a business owner who needed some day laborers and he hired some people at six in the morning and he goes back out at the end of the day, just a few minutes left in the day and hires some more people and he pays them all the same because he wants to know they're all taken care of. It doesn't add up. And here's why, grace doesn't add up. Another author put it this way, grace doesn't make demands, it just gives. Grace is unconditional acceptance given to an undeserving person by an unobligated giver. It is one way love. Jesus came to liberate us from the weight of having to make it on our own from the demand to measure up. He came to emancipate us from the burden to get it all right, from the obligation to fix ourselves, find ourselves and free ourselves. Jesus came to release us from the slavish need to be right, rewarded, regarded and respected. Because Jesus came to set the captives free, life does not have to be a tireless effort to establish ourselves, justify ourselves, and validate ourselves. Grace is recklessly generous, uncomfortably promiscuous. It doesn't use sticks, carrots, or time cards. It doesn't keep score. Grace is love that seeks you out when you have nothing to give in return. Grace is love coming at you that has nothing to do with you. Grace is being loved when you are unlovable. That's why Tim Keller put it this way. You are more sinful than you dared imagine, but you are more loved than you dared dream. Which means grace is not clean yourself up and then come to Jesus. Grace is not you've been good enough and Jesus will just fix up your blind spots. Grace means paid in full. Grace means there's nothing you can do to make God love you more. And there is nothing you can do to make God love you less. And the reason that is true is because Jesus, the son of God, died and rose again. The tomb is empty. He was seen. So our hope is real. Therefore, anyone, Jesus says, can come to Jesus no matter how disreputable you are. Jesus came, Jesus came for the broken. Now here's the second lesson. We're all broken. <laughs> Look back at verse 17. When Jesus heard this, he told them, hey, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. At every location right now, I'm gonna invite the ushers who collected those papers earlier to stand up, come down and pass those out right now. When you receive that, I want you to take out one paper from that. It will be a paper that someone else filled out. It will not be yours. Hold on to that and we will come back to that in a few moments. But look at this verse even as you're passing those. This is a point Jesus often makes in his teachings. It's not about how righteous you can be, it's about recognizing what a sinner you are. Notice that Jesus' message to the Pharisees is not, hey, you can't come in. His message to the Pharisees is, recognize you're just like them. Because anyone who comes to him gets grace. Anyone who comes to him gets endless second chances and everyone is welcome. In fact, one of our church plants has this as their slogan, hope for everyone. Regardless of who you are, what you've done, where you've been, the door is always open. There is always room at the foot of the cross. And catch this, this message is not just for some random broken person out there. This message is for us in here. See, we're all broken. Here's something that's my opinion. I used to think the biggest lie Satan tried to convince you of was you're not broken. But the longer I do this, I mean, the longer I'm a Christian leader, the more I just believe, you know, we all know, non-Christians know you're broken. In my opinion, here is the lie that Satan does try to convince us of that he's pretty good at. I'm the only one. I'm the only one. 
I'm the only one who thinks like that. I'm the only one who's addicted to that. I'm the only one who's involved with church but is tempted by this. I'm the only one who doesn't have what it takes. I'm the only one who thinks meds are my only option. I'm the only one who drinks to forget. I'm the only one. And if you're the only one, you hide, you pretend, you fake, you wear a mask. But we're all broken. We are all broken. See, we're like the people on D-Day. We've been shot. And the reality is some of it was something we did to ourselves. Some of it was stuff the world has thrown at us that we had no control over, but we find ourselves bleeding and the world outside of these rooms finds themselves bleeding and they don't know what to do about it. And the question is, is this a place where it's safe to bleed? Is this a place where it's safe to bleed? I believe it is. And I wanna show you. Get out your sheet of paper that somebody else filled out. Take it out right now. I'm gonna read through these one at a time. And as I instruct you, after I read each one, if the person who filled out your sheet of paper checked yes, I'm gonna ask you to stand to represent that person. All right? Question one, do you struggle with depression, fear, or anxiety? If your paper says yes, stand up. Have a seat. Have you ever thought about or attempted suicide? If yours says yes, stand up. Mm. Sit down. Have you had a sexual relationship with someone you weren't married to? Stand up. Have a seat. Have you been physically abused or physically abusive? If your paper says yes, stand. Okay. Look around. Have a seat. Have you ever been addicted to something? If your paper says yes, stand up. Sit down. Do you currently take medication for mental or psychological struggles? If your paper says yes, Stan. Yeah. Sit down. Are you ashamed of your sex life? If your paper says yes, stand up. You can have a seat. Are you lonely? If yes, stand up. Sit down. Have you ever struggled to believe that God loves you? He likes you and he wants what's best for you. If yes, stand up. You can have a seat. Last one, do you have any secrets? If yes, stand up. Take a good look around, folks. You are not alone. Have a seat. Some of you owe me, owe me a thank you note because that's the best workout you're going to get all week. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to me. Lean in on this. 
you think you're alone, you're not. You wonder if grace is for you, it is. You think church is for perfect people, it isn't. You wonder if God wants you, he does. You've wondered if there's a community for you, it's here. Satan wants you to think, I'm the only one. You are not alone. You are not alone. You are not alone. You've been shot and you're bleeding. But Jesus says, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. He says, I didn't come. For those who think the righteous, I came for sinners. In other words, I've come to call those who think they are bleeding. I've had people over the years of my preaching push back on me and say, Carl, I don't like that you say we're broken. Doesn't Jesus make us whole? Yes and no. Jesus died on the cross for our sin. He rose from the grave to prove he is God and to foreshadow what will one day happen for those who trust him. So are you forgiven? Are you pure? Are you perfect in God's sight if you've accepted the blood of Jesus as your sacrifice? Absolutely. Nothing can change that. But the good I want to do, I don't do. What I keep doing is the evil I don't want to do. So until I am raised from the dead with a glorified body, I'm still broken. It's why I love what Psalm 51 verse 17 says, the sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You won't reject a broken and repentant heart, oh God. So admit you're broken because Jesus did not come to call those who think they are righteous. He came to call those who know they are sinners, who know they've missed the mark, who know they need Jesus. So will you repent today? The Christian repents every day and say, God, without your grace, I'm nothing. But there's some of you who have not taken that step. And if I can just gently push, When will you let your brokenness overcome your arrogance? When will you set down your pride and say, Jesus, I just can't, and throw yourself at his feet and choose faith and repent and be baptized so you can call on his name and be saved? Before I wrap up, I need you to hear me. Today is part one of this series. And I know in an experience like this, there's thoughts going through our heads of, well, what about this? And and we should talk about that. We're gonna get there. You gotta come back next week. (laughs) So just hang on, we're gonna get there. If you wanna prepare for next week, you can read the first story in John 5 this week to prepare. I also want you to take that card home with you. I want you to put it on your mirror or in your paper Bible somewhere where you will pray for that person every day this week. Not long ago, I was doing my daily Bible reading and I came across a name of God that I had never seen before. And when I say a name of God, I mean simply that throughout the scriptures, at times when an individual or a group of people encounter God acting in a unique way, they will call God by a name reflecting what he did for them and to remind them of what God did to provide. So for example, some God provides for someone and they call him Jehovah Jireh. You're the God who provides. Right? Or In Matthew chapter one, when the angel is talking to Joseph about the birth of Jesus, the angel says, oh, and they're gonna give him a nickname. It'll be Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. That's just the nickname they'll give to Jesus. I was reading my Bible one day and I think it was Isaiah 56. And I ran across what, if we could read Hebrew, I, I can't either, would look like this. 
And the way you pronounce it would be this, Adonai Yehovah Kavatz Nadach. And I love what it means because it means the Lord God who brings back the outcast. The Lord God who brings back the outcast. And I'm reminded so often in the life of this church that we worship Adonai Yehovah Kavatz Nadach. It's when I get to go on a Sunday to the Addiction Recovery Center and worship next to my brothers at ARC, I'm reminded we worship the Lord God who brings back the outcast. It's when I look at the offering at multiple campuses of our encounter groups and just feel the pain that those groups represent. I know we worship the Lord God who brings back the outcast. It's when I visit camp and they say 33 baptisms today. I know we worship the Lord God who brings back the outcast. It's that time when you watch a baptism and it's not every time, but sometimes when you just see somebody whose face is streaked with tears or somebody who's, who's just giggling with laughter, the Lord God who brings back the outcast. It's when we when we sing all my life you've been faithful we're worshiping the Lord God who brings back the outcast it's when I mess up again and I ignore my wife or yell at my kids or fall to that same thing again when that voice says Carl just give up The Holy Spirit reminds me we worship the Lord God who brings back the outcast because that's me. And Jesus says, you are not too far gone. You are not too bad or messed up. You have not made too many mistakes. You are not too lazy or dysfunctional or too alone or too anything. Jesus says, I will bring you home and he will give you heaven. He will give you a better way to do life right now. And he gives you the church to get you through it. Because he came to call, not those who think they're righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, tonight's been heavy because we see a visual of the pain in the rows in which we sit. And God, it is a reminder we need you. We need you and we need each other. So God, I pray that the lesson we all take from today is we're not alone. We are not alone. There are other Christians who have the same struggle we do. We love you. Thank you for grace. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.